Welcome to the NYU Jazz Interview Series from the Steinhardt School, New York University. Today we have a very special guest, one of the great vibes players, band leaders, and all-around entrepreneur, Mr. Stefan Harris. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being had. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's been the case. No, no <laughs> let that one go. Right. Cut. No, we're good. Uh, Stefan, I want to talk to you specifically about your musical process today in your career and the, and the interesting and unique directions that you've kind of harnessed within uh, your world and, and how, you've, how you envision and inspire these concepts for your own students. So. Uh, uh, just one basic question: How do how do you see the role of of you as a musician in the world? Wow, one simple question. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I have to preface my reply by saying that I don't view myself as a musician. I have a, a notebook full of thoughts that I've written down, and one of the thoughts I wrote down maybe ten years ago is that I am not a musician. I have a gift which happens to manifest itself well in music, which is a very different thing than defining myself just as a musician. It's something, a statement like that really was a pivotal moment in my life because essentially what I did by writing that statement down, I gave myself permission to dream bigger than just the stage and to, I gave myself permission to engage other parts of my gift, of my, my intellect, that didn't have anything to do with the vibraphone necessarily. So in terms of my, my greater purpose as an artist, as a human being in this world, I, I like to lead with empathy first and foremost. I think it's uh, something that's been very effective in my life personally, and I think it's at the heart of uh, potentially solving many of the issues that we have as a society. It's about listening to each other first before we form an opinion. Now, I think what we do in the world of jazz is deeply connected to empathy because at its core, before we play a single note, we have to understand what's going on around us because we're improvising. There's nothing that's pre-written that we can simply f follow the directions. So before anything happens, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm getting to know everyone around me. When someone plays something, there's a decision that's being made because they're improvising. And the types of decisions that are being made around you tell you a lot about the people you're playing with. So I think music, particularly jazz, is a great uh, a forum to express empathy and to share that with the world. So my, my greater role, I think, is to help uh, talk about the value and inspire empathy in society, and I use music to do that. Now, I know uh, with our extensive conversations over the years that you've, you were an avid practicer when you were in school. You, you had a very strict regimen, uh, which, which shows today, and, and that gave you uh, a career say, but I also know that you said the first time you played a small club like the Vanguard, Village Vanguard, you said, uh, do I want to relegate my career playing in basements and I want to open this up to the world? And you wanted to play larger venues and larger opportunities that was more expansive than just playing for small groups of people. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, it's interesting. I actually didn't grow up playing jazz. Um, I grew up with what I would call the culture of jazz, but in terms of hearing Charlie Parker or Thelonious Monk, I didn't hear any artists like that until I was in college. Uh, my mother's a Pentecostal minister, so I grew up in the black culture and in, in black in the black church, and many of the cultural manifestations that come out in jazz are embodied in the church experience as well and outside of the church. Um, this idea of individual expression, that it's not just about copying and reiterating sounds from the past. When you stand up in church and you, and you sing, even if you're out of tune, the, the congregation's going to say, that's all right, baby. You, can, <laughs> it's, you get a certain level of support, and it's never that you're just copying other people around. It's about you telling a story. So I can remember sisters such and such standing up and saying, you know, last week my brother was sick and I want to let you know I really appreciate that everybody's been praying for, uh, for him and I want to tell you today that he's feeling better and all of a sudden the cord would just come in. 
and it would be just the right chord based on the emotion of what was happening in that moment. And then as she kept talking, the drums would start joining and then the bass and the emo So the music was there to serve the story that was being told. And I think my introduction into music from, from church music to soul music like Stevie Wonder, it just was always about the music being used for something greater than just playing the right chord changes. So I, I started playing classical music when I was in elementary school, middle school, and that was my true passion at that point. And when I got to college, I heard Charlie Parker for the first time, and that completely changed my life. The spiritual liberation and the feeling and and also the, the intellectual requirement for him to be able to improvise the way that he was, I found absolutely fascinating. So after my freshman year of college at Eastman, I, I transferred to Manhattan School of Music so that I could be closer to uh, jazz. They didn't really have a jazz program at Eastman at that point. Um, so I was coming from a, a perspective of, of classical music venues. I won a concerto competition when I was in ninth grade and I was able to tour Europe with an orchestra. We played the Mozartam, I played the Vienna Concert House. I grew up playing in the Troy City M Music Hall, which is one of the third best acoustic halls in the country. So my exposure in terms of performance venues was very large, it was very broad. And so when I first came to New York and started learning more about jazz and I went to a jazz club, everybody was talking about it and I went down and I was like, wow, so this is it. <laughs> like, Interesting, I, I think that maybe we can do something here and there's something that's incredibly dynamic and beautiful and intimate when you're playing in a club that you lose on a large stage, but I figured there was a way to do both. So in terms of the way I started to think about how I wanted my career to unfold, I started to plan out a pathway that wasn't just going to have me stuck in clubs. So one of the better decisions that I made very early on was in choosing a booking agent. I actually went with a classical booking agency and not a jazz booking agency because the classical booking agency had all the connections in the performing arts centers. And then during that period, uh, well, what am I gonna say, what was it, like the 90s? <laughs> the, when I was getting out of school, um, it was interesting because a lot of classical music festivals were beginning to open up to jazz. It hadn't happened a lot at that point, but there were a bunch of chamber music festivals. Um, so I was aware of that from being in classical music and meeting some uh, presenters in the classical world and hearing them talk about that. Um, so I decided to go that route. At the same time, you notice that in the jazz world, a lot of R&B and pop music, rappers and things were ending up on the jazz festival. So that ship was going this way. And I'm always thinking like, I want to be on the one that's going up. How do I get there first? So I think going with a classical agency really, really helped uh, jumpstart my career in a, in a very special way. Well, the, the, my first question regarding that is, how do you rate getting a management agency? Like if, if uh, people listening is, well, I'll go out and get a, get a manager. It's not so easy. No, and it's in, in dealing with a solution to any type of problem, you, you have to first assess the environment. You have to know what's going on during your time on the planet. When I was coming out of college, that's, the record companies were much more in control. It was still brick and mortar. We still had uh, these CD stores and things, and everybody couldn't just put a CD out on the internet. So you needed to get gain access to the distribution channels, which were held by large record companies. The way you got to a large record company, you needed that person in the middle. You needed the manager, right? To this day, you do need an agent, though. If you want to play larger venues, you don't get booked directly as an artist. I can't just call up a presenter and say, book me, right? So that's still intact. The management side of things is a little more ambiguous now, right? Because the, the musicians are so much more empowered because of the internet. Um, so it depends on your goal. So for me, what I wanted, it made sense to seek out management at that time. But if you said to yourself, I want to accomplish A, B, and C, your big picture dream first, and you start working backwards from there to build a plan, it may be that you need a manager, maybe not. There's not one pathway. And I know from our conversations that you are a very goal-oriented, driven person in that direction, that you, you seek out in and um, try to define the area of, of uh, music or beyond that over, over several years. You have a, a goal-driven two-year concept. Uh, that being said, uh, 
we were discussing earlier that you were interested in a career in music and all the potential that comes from being a musician, but you also have all this other potential that is also creative that, uh, and I think you, you might say, why just stick with music? Why just play music when I could also use my creative process to do these other things? Can you talk about that? <laughs> well, I think it's, 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 it's interesting. If I think about what I'm doing with my time on the planet, is it that I'm playing music? I'd like to think that I'm serving a greater purpose than just delivering notes and tones. That would certainly be my ambition. There's so many problems in the world, right? And, and if I don't play some role in addressing and solving some of the problems, to the, at least helping out, then I'm not sure that at the end of my time on the planet, I'm going to feel great about that, that I've, I took a very selfish approach. And certainly there are people who do that, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think you have to be authentic. And for me, I'm, I, f I feel for other people. When I see things going wrong, if there's something that I can do to help, I want to help. So when I think about music and its role, I, I don't even think that I'm just playing music. I walk into the situation first with, what do I want to do with my time on the planet? I think really, really big picture, and I write it all out. I have tons of notebooks with lots of thoughts written. <laughs> and I work backwards from there. It starts with empathy for me. And then I needed to come up with a mission statement for myself. And I needed to dream about how I was going to deliver that. And then I needed to come up with a strategic plan. Like, how, who's interested in empathy? How do you monetize that? Because we all need to make a living as well. Um, and how do I use music to tell those stories? And I had to break that down and find a pathway forward. But you, you use music as a performer, but I see you as one of my faculty at NYU as, as you use music as a pathway to understanding a, a process. It's a musical process, but it could be actually any process uh, defined in another situation. Right, so I, I, I feel like uh, I love teaching as much as I love playing, if not more. These days, I, I get up out, out of bed in the middle of the night with ideas about how to explain something. I, I couldn't quite re understand it a week ago. If one of my students asks me a question and I can't answer it, I'm excited. So I'll see you next week. I'm going to figure this out. Right? So it's a real passion of mine. And I, a lot of times at the end of an ensemble class, at the end of the semester, I'll tell the students that, you know, it's really not about what I said. Right? It's, I mean, there's lots of information out here on the internet and you have videos and lots of great faculty. I think part of my role as an educator is to be an example. It's that I was there first. That when I came in the building this morning, there was nobody here. And then when you walk past the practice room, I was in there practicing, right? And then you see that you, you asked me a question, I couldn't address it, and I came back with 12 answers a week later. You see the passion and drive that I put towards what it is that I love, and I hope to inspire that in others. That's part of what I think my job is as an educator. So again, that goes beyond, do I expect all of my students to become professional musicians? I really, it doesn't matter to me. I really want them to be happy. I want them to be authentic. I want them to feel alive. I want them to be able to wake up with the kind of energy that I wake up with. And I know from experience that if you are doing something that feels like a job to you, that's a hard road, and it's actually a choice, right? So, uh, in the end, you're you're teaching these people how to harness their their passion along with uh, their direction and drive um, to maybe use that as a musician, which is a lifelong passion and journey. And if you're lucky enough to have a career and uh, have people follow you and and uh, develop as a creative person. But you could also take that energy and move it somewhere else that may also be a passion that so many students in college, they, they have these other passions, but somebody has told them, hey, you're going to be a musician. Right. It's that idea of not defining yourself and put, don't put yourself in one little category. Sure, you play music, but there are probably other things that you do in your life that are very important and that you're passionate about. Why would you not spend your time on the planet with that at the forefront. So by virtue of the, the notion that I lead with empathy and that's what I care most about, um, when I s stop thinking just as a musician and I start to think about where empathy is valuable, I, I started to think about corporate environments. 
and the issues of leadership that occur on the bandstand when we're improvising. When you have four or five people together and you can't control the decisions that are being made, how do you lead in an environment like that? That's a major challenge. And there's a lot of uh, corporate teams that are suffering from this idea of micromanagement where the, the leadership is dictating to everyone exactly what they should be doing and people are afraid to make a mistake and that's not how you build the most creative team. Basically, when you, when you lead like that, people will give you exactly what you're looking for but the overall product will never be amazing. So as a musician, if I tell my drummer, play exactly like this, play, tell my bass player exactly what line to play, the music will always be limited to what's in my imagination, which is far inferior to the potential of the combination of music that could be made through the imagination of all the participants. So I've taken that message and I've been presenting in a lot of corporate environments and I've I feel that it's directly in line with my, mu with my mission in life because I want to culturally contextualize the music. Part of the reason we're valuable is because the, the clear, extremely articulate manifestation of empathy, the value of it. When you present and you're talking about leadership and you hear it in the context of music, it's incredibly clear whether you're a musician or not. So that's one other way that I've been able to liberate myself I'm still on stage when I'm doing it. I feel like the stage is home for me. I'm very comfortable on stage, but it doesn't have to be just playing jazz. Well, I interviewed Lenny White here on this stage, and he used the term uh, musicians are light bearers. And what that means is um, they hold these principles that you're talking about. And it's like, how do you express yourself? How do you express yourself in front of people? And how do you communicate with people? Uh, when a performer is on stage, having to express themselves and, and prove their, I, I don't want to say worth, or their skill, demonstrate their skill, um, that's different than somebody being in a corporate boardroom or somebody being in the back of the classroom who's just taking notes that doesn't have to be responsible for their process. So for the musician, the artist, you're responsible every time you're on the bandstand because everybody will know if you're in the conversation or you're not. Well, it's, it's, I think that's a similar dynamic to what people would want in a corporate setting, right? If you're, a, you're leading your team, you want your team to feel alive. You want them to feel that sense of responsibility and that sense of buy-in to the overall vision of the organization. So I, I think we have that in common, but it's just deeply personal when you're improvising. It's, well, I mean, you do have people who get on stage who will have transcribed a lot and they play back the material that they've transcribed and that that works, you can make nice sounding music, but that's not at the core of the culture of jazz, right? The culture of jazz, this is a music that comes from a, a, a people who didn't have the opportunity to express themselves. This is a music that is derived from a people who were being told that you are A, B, and C, and they knew deep inside that they weren't. And then you get the opportunity to be alone and you used music to express the beauty that you knew was inside of you, that you're not gonna be, relegate it to this narrow definition that greater society wants to hold you to. That's why people like Duke Ellington are such heroes of mine, you know? I mean, can you imagine what he went through in his lifetime traveling in the United States? Oh my goodness, I mean, traveling all over the world, but particularly in the United States. But he always carried himself with such dignity, such pride, such humility. It's, it's just, what a great example. And I, I think there's, if you take the notes and the tones and you leave out the culture, it's, I mean, it's, it's all okay, There's, I, I'm pretty open-minded, <laughs> but I think you might be missing out on the true value of the art form and what made this art form so valuable around the planet. It's not about virtuosity, right? It's about imagination, it's about freedom, it's about connectivity, it's about community. Well, I think this is why we need to have these discussions with uh, musicians, because if we just go to the internet, we can find anything now. And there's no context to what, what this music means as compared to the next thing you can Google or YouTube. And it's like, well, how does this music make sense? Because it's, uh, it's the notes and the rhythms and the melodies attached to a tradition. Right. You know, it's funny. It's, if you think about it, nowadays, knowledge is kind of overrated. 
That's a strange thing to say, but think about it. It used to be that it was very difficult to get information, and there were a few people in positions of power who held the information. If you needed to gain access, you needed to deal with the powerful people. But with the world now, the digital world, I mean, you can find out almost anything. So there's a big difference between someone who's knowledgeable and someone who's intelligent, although you can be both. But having lots of information doesn't make you intelligent. I think in intelligence manifests itself more in the form of insight, right? You could have 50,000 recordings and memorize every solo on it, but not say anything interesting or you not derive anything interesting from it. You could just sort of have all of the knowledge. Then you can have someone else who has two recordings, but they study them deeply in a way that changes their lives and they're able to interpret it in a way that's personal and they pull something out of that that is innovative, right? Because we talk about creativity. Creativity is another one of those feel good words that's kind of, I also think is overrated. I'm someone who buys into the notion of balance. I don't know if any words should be better than others, but creativity to me, it seems like it's something that happens on an individual basis. If I took this microphone and I swung it around and then I kicked over a glass of milk and screamed, hey, you probably have never seen that before. Someone could say, wow, he's so creative, but what does that do <laughs> to move society forward? It doesn't do anything in that moment, right? It's innovation that I think we ultimately seek. And innovation is something that's connected to making a unique insight about the world. When you look out into the same world that everyone else sees, but you see connections that they don't, that's what's special. And that's what the greatest practitioners of this art form have always been able to do, because it's always been about individual expression. If it's just about copying, you spend most of your time chasing after the vision, the dream of someone else, which is a tragedy, in my opinion. You're missing out on the whole benefit of the art form. Uh, it, it, to move on that concept of innovation, but I, th I think we all need to have one foot in the past as well. And we think about the internet now, we have unlimited access to all types of music, or maybe in the 1920s, Somebody bought a record and it has side A with one tune and side B on the other tune. Think about the, the depth of the experience when you just listen to one track for maybe three months and then that record wears out and you buy another one. So you can imagine if, if you had, say, uh, Louis Armstrong's West End Blues where he plays this unbelievable yeah. trumpet intro and you've listened to that 5,000 times as compared to, oh, it's online, I'll listen to it once, that was very nice. Right. You can say, I can say, yeah, I know that solo. <laughs> and again, I, I definitely think that it's important to know your history, right? You need to understand the context in which you want to create. But the goal, I would think, would be a, about your individual insight into the connections of what's happening in history. So I, I push back about that. I'm not someone, I actually don't transcribe at all, and I've never been someone who transcribed, um, although there, I don't think there's anything wrong with transcribing, I'm, I'm someone who looks at the problem and I work backwards from there. As, an, as a musician, I feel like I know exactly the way I wanna play. It's perfectly clear to me. It's in my head, I have no doubt, there's no question, I know exactly what it feels like, the ideal way I wanna express myself. So because that's so clear to me, what I do is I work backwards and I start thinking, well, what's stopping me from expressing myself like that. What is the problem? And then when I identify the problem, I start to say, okay, that's the problem. How do I fix that? And for my personal journey, the solution to fixing that problem has never been copying someone else. But it could be in another circumstance. Well, let me pose this question to you. Uh, do you think there's true improvisation in jazz? Uh, or I had Richard Bona on this stage and he said there is no improvisation it's like musicians are perfecting the process and he says the only time that there is true improvisation is when you're in the jungle and all of a sudden you're faced with a lion <laughs> well, <laughs> well this, the stakes aren't quite as high as that when we're on stage but I, I would suggest that the culture of this music is such that we should create a circumstance where you feel like you're face, facing a lion. Something should go wrong when you're on the bandstand with other musicians. If everything is perfect, you're not really, there's nothing wrong with it, it's, it's good, it's good. But I don't think people buy into what we do as artists because it sounds good, 
right? I think they buy into why we're doing what we're doing because we embody creativity because we're vulnerable. We trust each other, right? We come on stage. We don't know what's going to happen in front of an audience. We bear our hearts and we bear our souls, right? And I think people appreciate that element. Of course, you, you have to make music that sounds good. There's lots of music that sounds good, though. I think people are buying into something deeper than just a sound. So that element of, of fear, of the unknown, I think if you don't have that, then yeah, it's not improvisation. You can't just come up and play all of your stuff in front of an audience. It's a dissertation. That's, that's definitely not improvisation. You have to take chances and be vulnerable to improvise. So your work ethic has led you to develop this phenomenal ear training process and ear training method. Um, I want to get to that in a second, but I want to make the statement that uh, paraphrased Charlie Parker, who said, uh, you know, learn everything about music and music theory uh, and practice, and then when you get on the bandstand, forget it all and just play. Let's talk about when you play. Um, how much is, I, I understand the harmony, I hear the harmony, I hear the chords, I have uh, a, uh, an idea, a direction. How specific can you tell us what you're thinking about on the bandstand? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> because it's different all the time, right? If I'm, if I'm playing with an ensemble, the main thing that I'm doing is I'm listening to what's happening around me. And by starting from the perspective of empathy, you find that the ideas seem to be infinite. You, you, you can't predict what the drummer is going to do and the bass player at a given moment. And if you're listening, there's something that's unique, that's bound to happen. And then if you're connected to that and you're responding to that, the ideas will always flow. So first and foremost, I'm, I'm focused on paying attention to the other people around me and letting the music flow from there. In terms of uh, addressing harmony, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing because you obviously have to address the harmony, but you don't want to be a victim of the harmony, right? You don't, you don't want to have the harmony dictate to you how the music should sound. So a lot of times you hear people play and they're basically spelling out chord changes. And if we think about why we play music, why people listen to us, that's not exactly why the audience is there, right? I think it's more about your ideas and then you're supposed to have, not supposed to, forgive me, I don't want to say that, um, but ideally you have this harmonic progression that's happening around you that's there to facilitate the emotional content of your ideas. You're not there to serve the harmony. Harmony is not more important than the idea, right? That's why you can improvise without any harmony at all and hopefully play something that moves everyone in the room, or you can put it in a harmonic context. So a lot of times I'm trying hard to lead with the idea itself, right? And then the harmony sort of tells me these are the parameters that this idea exists within. But I'm not first thinking, this is the chord, these are the notes I gotta play. Hopefully I've practiced enough and I've studied enough that I don't have to think about that on the mo in the moment, right? But clearly in the practice room, like Charlie Parker is saying, you put in lots of work so that you can let go. So it's, it's, a, it's also an unfolding process. Like I really don't know what I'm gonna play. So you walk out and you, and you start and, and you hope that something interesting happens. And then sometimes something interesting doesn't happen and you have to be okay with that. You gotta go wherever the music goes. Well, what's, what, what would you say is the percentage of uh, music that's driven when you're performing that's coming from the brain or that's coming from your muscle memory? Hmm. <laughs> I think just about everything comes from the brain, so <laughs> that's tough. But, but I know what you mean. There's some physical things right. that occur on a given instrument. Um, one of the ways that I try to avoid that, because I, I definitely can relate to that, um, is I try not to, it's an interesting thing, I try not to practice a lot of stuff that I'm going to play. <laughs> I, I practice really, really small bits, right? I figure it's like just one little word here, one little word there. It's not a complete sentence. So when I'm on stage, I can sort of improvise that. Whereas if I worked out full lines and I'm taking lines in all 12 keys, the likelihood of me throwing that line out there is, is far greater. So, but there is a thing about muscle memory that it's unavoidable. And the nice thing about it is that some of it is going to be connected to you as an individual, right? If you're really tall, you're going to have certain 
isms that come out. If you're short, there's certain isms. If you're big, if you're small, your, your touch is going to be different. So it's not, it's not a bad thing. I just don't think, for me, I don't want to lead with something because I physically have been practicing that same thing all the time. I want to be open and be available for whatever the music wants me to do at that moment. So now can you tell us about your ear training app that you're, de you're developing that's going to come out soon? And uh, did that app come from your desire to learn how to hear better or your desire to teach students how you hear? <laughs> that's great. I suppose it's a combination of both, but I, I really am passionate about helping others, but I, I learned so much along the way, going through the process of figuring out how to teach, it forces me to have a thorough understanding of the fundamentals. If I, if I can't do it, if I can't hear it, if I can't explain it to myself, how am I going to explain and teach it to others? Um, so about 10 years ago now, my goodness, time flies. <laughs> I uh, opened up a big book of 500 blank pages and I said, you know what, I want to I want to work towards creating a teaching system that is more intuitive the way that I remember learning music coming up in, in, in black culture and just the organic way that I, I remember learning music. And then when I started to study and learning theory and it became more like you match this scale to this sound, but I couldn't necessarily hear every note. Then I started writing music. And then I went on tour and I, f I found like all the stuff that I had been learning, it didn't help me articulate the way that I wanted to play my own music. Like I could play in all 12 keys and I could play all different standards and things like that was great. But when I was writing music, I hated playing that kind of stuff on my own music. So the writing process forced me to be honest and say, why am I improvising? Is it about playing vocabulary or, or am I here to bring out some special characteristic in the moment of what's happening with other musicians and something that's in the core character of the song itself. So I was like, I'm going to start over. And I opened that big notebook and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to pick up this pencil and start writing some thoughts down. And then I came up with the idea that I wanted to design a full college curriculum, but I needed to come up with an, a fully integrated system. And so it started a, a decade ago with me writing notes. My system is called melodic progression, and I actually work backwards. My students don't get to a seven note scale probably till their senior year with me. We start with very small structures and everything starts with ear training. If you can't hear it, why are you playing it? What's the point of that? <laughs> I mean, there are moments where you just jump and you want to have some recklessness about your music making. You definitely want to have that. That keeps it fun and it keeps it interesting for you and for the audience. But in general, we start very small. Everything starts with ear training. So I went through many years and I developed teaching techniques around solfege, around rhythm, around ear training, improvisation. Came up with a different way to explain chord progressions, et cetera, et cetera. And then I got to the point <laughs> after almost a decade where I was like, okay, I'm ready to write the books now. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? Books run their way out. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> technology is so much further than when I first started with these ideas. And I was thinking about the beauty of an app and how much more interactive an app would be. So I started to come up with a two-year plan <laughs> and started to seek out a, a partner. And I, I, I met someone in, in Seattle who's a brilliant, brilliant software designer uh, named Cliff Swiggett. Um, and we started to partner together. And it's been almost two years now. We started working on the first app. It's called the Harmony Cloud. Um, I can't get into <laughs> too much about how it works, but it's, hmm. It's, it's something that's going to give access to lots of people to experience harmony, not just from a theoretical perspective. So it's, it's something that will generate chord progressions that you can play along with. And <laughs> I don't want to say too much. It's going to be out by the end of the summer, though, the Harmony Cloud. But you're going to demonstrate that in a few minutes. Yeah. So when I, when I play, I'll, I've, I've actually never done this. We're just getting to the point where uh, uh, it's ready to be presented a little bit. We have some presentations coming up in a few weeks, actually. Uh, so I'm going to end up putting on the Harmony Cloud for an improvisation. And the thing is, it's unpredictable. I don't know what it's going to do. It's always musical, but I don't know where it's going. So I, I'm going to pick an idea 
and I'm going to lead with my ideas. So the first improvisation that I'm thinking I'll do, maybe I'll pull an idea from the audience, totally unpredictable, you guys tell me what, I'll see what I can do with it. Then I'll put the harmony cloud on, and I'm not gonna let the harmony dictate to me how to play. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with the ideas that we were talking about, and I'm gonna try to be creative and adjust to the harmony as it moves around me. Okay, we look forward to that. Hey, in closing today, I always ask uh, our special guests, uh, what words of advice do you have for all the, the young musicians and everybody listening to move forward, pursue a career as a creative person, and, uh, and, and do what you want to do with your dreams? <laughs> well, one thing is, I'm a stickler for words. And, and I think it's important because the more you say something, whether it's true or not, you start to believe it. So you want to be careful about just taking something that someone else is saying over and over again and not questioning it. The greatest artists question everything, right? It's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a very personal process. So one of the things that I remember thinking about very early on, again, because I didn't grow up in what you would think of as jazz culture, although I think of it that way, I thought of that word tradition and people talking about traditional jazz and you should learn traditional jazz. And I was like, man, that doesn't make any sense. Actually, the tradition of jazz is that of creativity. It's, it's that of innovation. When you look at the greatest practitioners, they weren't spending their time on the planet copying and reiterating sounds from the past. So pay attention to words like tradition and take ownership of it, right? The, the music is great. Well, art in general, part of the reason that art is significant, in my opinion, for our culture is that it's, it's a documentation of what's happening on the planet right now. So 500 years from now, the People are going to know something about what we did with our time on the planet, who we were, the way we thought about the world based on our art. The same way that we look back at hieroglyphics and we, we listen to music from hundreds of years ago and we know something about the vaunts of that particular culture. So it's our responsibility as artists, not just in the realm of music, but in general, to document our time on the planet. So you should take ownership if you're a young musician and know that Charlie Parker did a very good job documenting that time period. Amazing. And there's no way we're going to recreate that. And it would be sad in terms of fulfilling part of our responsibility as artists if we don't document what's happening in our world right now. Make music that is about our personal experiences. I think um, that's another way that will help grow our audiences. So if we make music about our personal experiences, there are lots of other human beings on the planet who experience life like us. There are not a lot of human, human beings on the planet who care about tritone substitutions, though. And if you're leading with that, you can't be mad if the audience doesn't get it. So take ownership, know that it's your music, there's no rule, and also know that there's no way I could create what you could create as a young musician. I have no idea you see the world with different eyes, but if you don't document it, it's not gonna happen. Well, Stefan, thanks for sharing your experiences today. They've really articulate and uh, very special. So thanks. Thank you for having me, I Stephon appreciate Harris, it. Stefan Harris, everybody. All right, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna turn on the Harmony Cloud. Actually, let me take a quick second and tell you, if you email me at info at melodicprogression.com. Info at melodicprogression.com. Just send an email saying, hey, when the app comes out, we'll send you a note and you'll be able to get it. <laughs> Info at melodicprogression.com. Okay, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hit play. It's gonna play for about five minutes. It's just generating movements. I have no idea what movements it's generating. It's you kind of play along by ear, you test yourself, scale, scales, I don't, I don't know. It's totally unpredictable, all right? Here we go. I'm just gonna have, for now, it's just like a string sound with, with a little bass. Flada, fubu da da. <laughs> 